Uh, when I'm going to add f prime of a over two, f prime of a uh, to all three sides of this inequality to get um, uh, f prime of a over two is less than f of x minus f of a over x minus a less than three f prime of a over two. Now this is still if x minus a is less than delta and x is greater than a. Uh, and just uh, to recall, right, by our assumption, f prime of a is greater than zero, so this is greater than zero. So now I'm going to concentrate only on this part of the inequality, right? So uh, it follows from here. Uh, use a different color. It follows from here that f of x minus f of a over x minus a is going to be greater than zero, right? Because by transitive property of um, uh, a comparison, right? This guy is bigger than this guy, bigger than zero. So that means that this expression is greater than zero. Again, if x minus a absolute value is less than delta, and x is uh, greater than a. Uh, and actually, uh, another conclusion that I can draw from this, if uh, absolute value of x minus a is less than delta and x is greater than a, that's the same thing as saying uh, x minus a is less than delta and greater than zero. Okay, so with that, uh, with that, what do we have? So now if I combine this inequality with the fact that x minus a is uh, positive, what do I know? I know that the ratio is greater than zero, denominator is greater than zero, so I can multiply uh, both sides of this inequality by x minus a, so times x minus a, and what I'm going to get then is that f of x minus a, that this difference is greater than zero again when, if uh, zero is less than x minus a less than delta. And then uh, what follows from here? Well, if f of x minus f of a is greater than zero, uh, then that means that f of x is greater than f of a if uh, x is uh, slightly larger than a, right? And this is a contradiction contradiction, uh, the assumption that f has a local maximum at a. Uh, right, so once again, uh, because, because, uh, because the ratio of f of x minus f of a and x, x, x minus a is positive, x minus a itself is positive, then f of x minus f of a must be positive to the right of a, and that's a contradiction with the fact that f of x should be less than f of a. Uh, less or equal than a, f of a, uh, near uh, x equal to a. Okay, so that means that the derivative cannot be 
positive at A, at the point of a local maximum. Uh, and uh, we can use similar arguments Uh, to show that f prime of a cannot be negative. And once we have done that, then the proof is complete. But the proof uh, of that second part is going to go in exactly the same way except that uh, you will need to, if f prime of a is negative, you need to consider uh, left side limit of f of x as x goes to a, and uh, a similar, you will establish a similar uh, inequality so that f of x minus f of a must be positive, except that now it is going to be true if x minus a is negative and greater than minus delta. Regardless, in both cases, if um, derivative is not equal to zero, then uh, you're going to get a contradiction. Uh, of course, this is uh, geometrically clear, right? If a derivative is positive at some point, that means that the function is, again, from experience, uh, the slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function is going to be positive, and so there is no way that um, you have a local maximum or local minimum at A. Uh, but now we have a rigorous proof of this fact. Okay, so uh, next, uh, next theorem that we're going to prove uh, is going to use the theorem that we just proved a moment ago uh, to uh, lead us to the mean um, value theorem, which is one of the most important theorems of calculus. Uh, now, to uh, motivate uh, the mean value theorem, uh, let's think about uh, uh, trying to, f to show the following fact. Uh, so, let's suppose that, let's suppose uh, that I know uh, that f prime of x is, uh, well, actually, not that. Suppose that I know that f of x is, uh, no, f prime of x is equal to zero for all x in AB. Uh, of course, that uh, we know should lead us to the conclusion that f wants to be a constant, that f will be a constant on AB. Uh, but how are we going to prove it? So again, from uh, drawing a picture, you will be able to possibly uh, conjecture something, but how do you prove this fact? Uh, Okay, so let's see, what, what do we do? Uh, we know that at some point x, f prime of x is equal to zero. Or in fact, at all points, at points x, f prime of x is equal to zero. So then this means that if I take uh, the limit as, uh, let's say, t goes to zero of f of t minus f of x divided by t minus x, I know that this should be 0. And uh, this is true for all x in AB. Fine. But how do I conclude from that that f must be equal to a constant? It's not really, really clear. Right? If you try to think about it, it's not going to be clear because what do I know? I know that uh, this limit 
will be zero, right? Uh, that tells me basically that f of t goes to f of x faster than t uh, goes to x, right? Because the difference on the top is going to be going to zero faster than the difference on the bottom. But that doesn't really tell me anything about the difference uh, having to be equal to zero, right? I know that at each point, uh, the statement like this is going to hold, and f of t is going to converge to f of x faster than t will go to x. But uh, by itself, this really doesn't tell me anything about uh, f of t itself, right? At, uh, about f of t near uh, f of x, besides the fact that, just like I said, f of t goes to f of x faster than t goes to x. Uh, somehow, in this case, I know this limit in at many different points of my interval, right? That, in fact, at all points of my interval, when I take a limit like this, the limit is going to be equal to zero. But why should that uh, imply that the function is constant? It's not obvious. So somehow I want to come up with some property of my function that will... Um, property of my function as a whole on this interval from A to B, which will be related to the fact that the derivative is equal to zero at all points on AB, and from which I might be able to conclude something. Some property about the uh, average behavior of the function on the interval from A to B. Or that I can guarantee if, the, uh, this, limit, if this limit is equal to zero, that I can guarantee that uh, there exists a point in the interval AB where something will happen. And so we will see, uh, once we provide the proof of the mean value theorem, we will see how this fact is used. Uh, okay, so let me get rid of this statement. Uh, so next theorem is going to be the mean value theorem. Uh, it's going to be actually not a mean value theorem, uh, but something equivalent, which is called Rawls theorem. Uh, so the theorem is going. This theorem is going to state the following. Uh, so let's suppose that f is differentiable on some interval a, b. Uh, f is continuous. on AB, and I want to uh, mention something about the second statement. We already proved that if the function is differentiable on some, uh, at some point, then it must be continuous at that point. So if I said that F is differentiable on the open interval AB, it means that F has to be continuous on the open interval AB. When I'm saying that I want it to be continuous on a closed interval from A to B, that means that in addition, I don't want my function to have any jumps at the endpoints. So it is continuous up to and including the endpoints. So really, that second statement only talks about endpoints because anything inside the interval is covered by the first assumption. And number three, uh, let's suppose that f at the endpoints of the interval is exactly the same, has exactly the same values. So then, and here, let's try to motivate this. Okay, and I'm going to draw a picture. Uh, let's say fx, I have a function that satisfies this condition that at the initial point and at the final point, the value of the function is the same. And my function is continuous between a and b. So that means that I should be able to connect A and B by drawing a curve 
without lifting the pen of the paper. And not only that, but also that curve is going to be differentiable, so there is a tangent line to this curve at every point on the interval AB. So what can I conclude should exist from this picture? Well, there should exist a point where uh, my function reaches its maximum value, uh, possibly its minimum value, or at least one, either only a maximum or only a minimum. And if the function is differentiable, so there must be a point, so even if it is not differentiable, uh, well, let, let me just say it uh, like I was saying. If the function is differentiable, then I should have a local maximum or local minimum. So that means my uh, that uh, there should be a tangent line to the graph of my function with a slope zero. And if there should be a function, uh, it should be a tangent line with a slope zero. So there must be some point C inside the interval from A to B. In this case, it appears that I have two such points here and here, where derivative of the function is equal to zero. And so that's going to be my conclusion here. Then there exists C inside open interval AB such that F prime of C is equal to zero. All right, so now let's try to uh, give a proof of this. And the proof is going to go as follows. So first of all, uh, number one, suppose that um, f of x is uh, equal to f of a, which already is equal to f of b for all x and a, b. Well, then there is nothing to do, because then uh, my function is a constant. So f is a constant function. And therefore, f prime of x is equal to 0 for all x and ab. And so I can use any point in a b as c done right so there's not much to do in this case uh, number two okay so uh, one option is that f of x is a constant equal to f of, a, f of b for all x and on a b well if not then what should I be able to find? I should be able to find some point x inside AB where f of x is greater than f of A and f of B, or some point inside uh, AB where f of x is going to be strictly less than f of A and f of B. So if, 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 or suppose uh, that exists, let's say, an x0 in AB such that f of x0 is equal to, A is strictly greater than f of A, which is, of course, the same as f of b. Well, in this case, uh, what do I have? So, uh, we know 
that f is continuous. on a closed interval AB. Uh, in fact, that's not the implication. It's a separate statement. Uh, since F is continuous on closed interval AB, then by extreme value theorem, it follows that F achieves its maximum and minimum value on AB. Right? We proved that at some point before. Uh, and uh, I can also conclude that since f of x0 is bigger than f of a and f of b, uh, the point of maximum of my function f is not at one of n the endpoints. Right, this should be a clear statement because the value of the function at the endpoints is smaller than f of x0. So that means that the maximum should be some uh, point inside AB. And so therefore, there exists a point C inside the open interval AB where f has a maximum, and if it has a maximum in the interior, then that maximum is also a local maximum, right? Because if my function has a global maximum somewhere, its value dominates values of the function everywhere on, on the domain. But now because a point is inside, then this absolute maximum or global maximum is actually a local maximum as well. So that's our conclusion. And then from that, we now conclude f is differentiable on the entire interval, open interval AB. In particular, it should be differentiable at C, right? Because C is inside AB. And this would imply that f prime of c is equal to zero by the previous theorem. Right, and so I'm done. And number three. So again, the proof is completed here. And number three is going to be very similar. In fact, uh, for me, it's easy to do here because I can just copy the statement and modify it just a tiny little bit, but I don't have to do it because really at the end of the day, it will be kind of the same statement or a similar statement. So what have we got? So let me put this here. So now I suppose that there exists an x0, uh, a point where f of x0 is strictly less than f of a minus equal to f of b. f is still continuous, f still achieves its uh, maximum minimum values on a, b, and then since f of x0 is less than f of a and f of b, then a point not of a maximum, but of the minimum of f of a uh, of f is not going to be at one of the endpoints. So therefore, there exists a C where f has a local now minimum. If I can change this. Sorry.
And so, because a function has a local minimum, there's still, this is still a point where derivative of f is equal to zero. Okay, so that means that in all three situations, uh, my proof is complete. So that means that all three situations that are uh, mutually uh, distinct, but they exhaust all possibilities. So the proof is done. So the Rawls theorem is proved. Okay, so we have this. And from that, now we can deduce uh, the mean value theorem itself. And uh, let me state it before we'll prove it. Uh, and actually, before I state it, let's try to uh, motivate it by using a picture. So the Rolls theorem that I just demonstrated had a function which started and ended at the same level at the points of the interval a, b. I connected two points, and I can guarantee that there is at least one point uh, where slope of a tangent line is zero. Now, what will change if I abandon the condition that f of a is equal to f of b? Let's say I have two points like that uh, on the interval a, b. And now I would like to connect these two points by a continuous curve, so maybe something like this. I uh, cannot guarantee in this case that there would be a point where the derivative uh, of my function is equal to zero. Well, clearly not, because I can, uh, one of the possible ways to connect two points is going to be a straight line. And for a straight line like that, uh, clearly uh, there is not going to be a point where a straight line has a zero slope. Uh, actually, for the straight line, the slope everywhere is going to be exactly the same, right? So for this straight line, slope is the same everywhere. Okay, so then if I want to be able to guarantee that my function has some specific slope at some point on the interval uh, from A to B, then the only possible choice for this slope is going to be actually the slope of a straight line, because in particular, my result should work for a straight line, and straight line has uh, only one possible slope. And geometrically, I can see that this actually is true, right? Because if I connect uh, two points by a continuous curve, then somewhere the slope must be uh, the same as the slope of a line that connects two endpoints. Uh, one thing which is actually important in this case is that uh, the statement that the function has to be uh, continuous and differentiable on the interval is crucial here, right? Because if, for example, my function is continuous, not continuous, and maybe not differentiable at one point, then maybe I have a function that looks like this, straight line like that, then straight line like this, and this is my A, this is my B. Maybe this will be the same level, right? And even though uh, the function starts and ends at the same level, because the curve is discontinuous at some point, uh, right, in this case, the slope everywhere, except for that point where the slope is undefined, is something that is not equal to zero, is some negative number. Uh, so regardless, the mean value theorem is going to be the analog of the Rolls theorem, except that, I, again, I'm going to drop the condition that f of a is equal to f of b, and then in conclusion, I should be able to guarantee the existence of a line with a slope, uh, existence of a tangent line, with a slope that is equal to the slope of a line that connects two endpoints. Uh, last thing about the motivation, why also this has to be true. Uh, if, for instance, um, 
well, let me label the coordinates here. If this is, if x coordinate is time, and y coordinate is uh, position, so s is going to be position of uh, let's say a car as it moves along the straight highway, uh, and t is time where the car is going to be at a given point uh, at a given time t. Uh, so if this, let me get rid of this guy, uh, if this curve uh, gives me a position of the card along the straight highway at the time t, then I see, what do I see actually? I would see that first the position increases faster than later on, and then it increases again. So if I think about the car, how was it moving? Uh, in a period of time from A up to here, it was going uh, fast, but then the speed, which is a slope of the tangent line to the position curve, then the speed went down. At some point, the speed turned to zero, so that means that probably the car was stopped during this period of time. And after that, it started accelerating, Right? It goes a higher and higher speed, and uh, then it slows down again. So with this distance speed interpretation, what exactly uh, does this mean value theorem result mean to me? Well, if I compute the slope of a line that connects the initial point and a final point, what will it be? It's going to be a change in... Uh, S variables divided by the change in T variable. So change in S variable will give me a total distance traveled between the initial point and the final point. And uh, A is the initial time, B is the final time, so if I take the entire distance traveled and I divide it by the time it took me to get to travel that distance, then what this is going to be is going to give me an average speed. So then what does my uh, result telling me? It tells me that if I have a car which moves along the straight highway with a certain average speed, then uh, the statement that uh, there should be exist a point where the slope of a tangent line is the same as the slope of a line that connects initial to the final point, the statement basically says that there should be some point of time where the car will be moving with an average speed uh, on that given interval, time interval. And that should be clearly true, right? Because if I'm riding in a car, I cannot always go faster than uh, an average speed. Or I can always go slower than an average speed. I should always move, be moving with an average speed, at least at some times, uh, right uh, to get from one point to another. Okay, so that's a lot of talking. Now let's write down the theorem and prove it. Um, actually, one more one more thing. Uh, let me again draw a graph. Let's think about the interpretation of a Rolls theorem. And again, use this time distance analogy. So if I have uh, a car again along the straight highway, position along the highway is given by S. What does this graph tell me? It tells me that I started at some point, then I moved forward, and then after that I moved backward. And eventually, I ended, I ended up at the same point, right? At two different times, at the initial time and the final time, I'm at exactly the same point. So what does the, what is my average speed on this interval? If I ended up at the same point where I started, that means that the average speed must be zero. And what does it again, what does the role theorem mean in terms of his speed analogy? It just means that if my average speed is zero, then that means that at some point my instantaneous speed would be zero because at some point I will have to turn around 
to bo- go back uh, where I started. If uh, instantaneous speed, for example, is always positive, then I'm always going to be moving away from the initial point, and there is no way for me to come back. Okay. Stating mean value theory. So the statement should be basically exactly, not exactly the same, but very similar to the statement that I used for uh, Rolls feed. Uh, let's suppose that F is continuous on some interval. A, B, and F is differentiable on the open version of A, B. So then there exists a C inside A, B such that f prime of c is equal to the average uh, change of f uh, with respect to x on the interval a, b, so such that uh, f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. And the proof of this goes as follows. Now, one thing that I want to note immediately here, uh, it seems that the Rolls theorem will follow from mean value theorem. Why? Because the only additional assumption of a Rolls theorem is that f of b is equal to f of a. And if f of b is equal to f of a, then f of b minus f of a is zero. So then mean value theorem tells me that there should be a point c where f prime of c got to be zero. Right, so Rolls theorem is a consequence of the mean value theorem. Uh, this is what we're going to do. Uh, let's um, actually let me draw one more picture before I write down the proof. So in this case, we have some function right that connects a f of a b f of b and uh, we need to consider a line which connects uh, two endpoints right so i have a function f of x uh, and i'm going to call the line denote the line for a moment as l of x right uh, if i Look at f of x minus l of x. Uh, And in fact, I can call this h of x. Then what should be true about h of x? Uh, Linear function is, of course, differentiable everywhere. Linear function, of course, is continuous everywhere. So then sum or difference of two continuous functions is continuous. The difference of two uh, differentiable function is differentiable. So H should inherit differentiability and continuity properties of F. Right? Because L is always continuous and differentiable. So then the function H is continuous and differentiable, continuous on the closed AB, differential, differentiable on an open AB. But more than that, because F and L intersect at the initial point A and the initial point B, it should be true that H of A, right, if I take a difference, and H of B, they're both equal to zero. And then H should be a function that satisfies Rolls theorem, and then about that function, I should be able to say that there exists a point where derivative of h is equal to zero. And from that, the proof will follow. So keep this picture in mind. Uh, Again, suppose 
that uh, the conditions of the theorem uh, hold and I'm going to define now this function f of x, uh, h of x so and define uh, h of x equal to f of x minus now I need an equation of the line which connects uh, point a f of a b f of b so for that I can use a point slope formula right or two points formula actually uh, what is it going to be uh, let's do it as uh, as a side here so point slope formula says y minus initial point y did you, y um, coordinate of the initial point which is f of a is equal to the slope slope is the slope of a line that connects the initial point and the final point so that's f of b minus f of a over x minus a over b minus a sorry and so the rest of the point slope formula says that I need to multiply this by x minus a and so then if I solve for y I'm going to get f of a plus this stuff right so this would be an equation of a line uh, that connects the initial and the final point equation of a line l of x that I was talking about and so then I can just take that equation and subtract it from f of x. So let's do this. Okay, so then uh, what do I know about the function h of x? Uh, of course, again, this is my function, which is differentiable and continuous. And this is a linear function of x, so it's differentiable and continuous everywhere. So h is continuous on a b and differentiable on the open version of a b right, just by the properties of continuity and differentiability. And in addition to this, h of a is going to be f of a minus all of this stuff with x replaced by a. But if I replace x by a, then there is nothing left, right? Because this is 0, and then I have f of a minus f of a, so 0. And likewise, h of b Well, it's going to be h of b, so I need to replace x equal to a by x equal to b. Well, in that case, what am I going to get? I'm going to get that b minus a will cancel out. Then I have f of a plus f of b minus f of a, and that is f of b, and then I have f of b minus f of b, still 0. So then h satisfies the conditions of the Rolle theorem, and so therefore by 
Rawls theorem. There exists a C inside the open interval AB such that H prime of C is equal to zero. But what is H prime of C? Uh, H prime of C is a derivative of this function, right? And this function consists of a difference between f of x and the linear function. And what is the derivative of a linear function? It is a slope, and the slope is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. And so uh, from h prime of c being equal to 0, it follows that f prime of c minus f of b minus f of a over b minus a, that this must be equal to 0, right? Because, again, h prime of x is the derivative of this. It's going to be f prime of x minus uh, this constant slope. So if I evaluate it at c, I'm going to get this stuff equal to 0. And, of course, that implies if I move uh, the slope to on, on the right side of the of this equation, this implies that f prime of c is the same thing as f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And that's exactly what I wanted to show, so we're done. And uh, one last comment here. So note... We said before that Rawl theorem should follow from mean value theorem. Uh, but now I used Rawl theorem to prove mean value theorem. So that means that each theorem follows from another one. And so that means that Rawls theorem and mean value theorem, that's the abbreviation that I'm going to use, uh, they're equivalent. Okay, and then next time we're going to apply uh, mean value theorem to uh, different situations to uh, find what the consequences of a mean value theorem are.